to Liverpool in the northwest of England. Welcome to the Liverpool Echo uh, Arena here on the banks of the River Mersey. And welcome to this, the 2018 National Eucharistic Pilgrimage and Congress being held here uh, in uh, Liverpool. Three days in total, thousands of pilgrims, hundreds of activities, but all with one purpose, to spread devotion, love and knowledge of Jesus Christ, truly present in the Eucharist from this city in the northwest of England around the world. Well, this Congress was appropriately begun with prayer led by Archbishop Malcolm McMahon, the city's Archbishop, on Friday morning, and I'm delighted to say that Archbishop McMahon joins us now. Your Grace, it's great to have you here on Shalom World uh, TV. Um, this is quite an event. I've heard the Eucharistic Congress referred to as the Spiritual Olympics. How does it make you feel as the Archbishop of Liverpool to see this taking place in your home city? Well, now I feel very proud. Uh, so pleased that uh, people have gathered here to take part in this pilgrimage and congress focused on the presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. Liverpool is a wonderful place. It's um, a port city and it's more than that because so many different communities have travelled through Liverpool. We, the, we think of, say, of the Jewish community coming from, in the 19th century, coming from Eastern Europe, a uh, long journey across Europe, across the North Sea, then across England to get on, on boats to North America. The Irish came the same way. And the, so Liverpool is a, a haven. It's a place of rest and refreshment, as well as being somewhere which is uh, open to new futures to a new life in other places. And even in this day and age, we welcome so many different communities, people from southern India, from the Philippines. We've always had a Chinese community here, believe it or not. But we also have asylum seekers, people who are being persecuted for their religion or because of their, their economic situation, can't, can no longer stay in their home. And Liverpool is very much that place of welcome, rest and refreshment. So it's an ideal place to have the Eucharistic Congress. In terms of the international mm. calendar of Catholic events that mm. are out there, you have certain um, gatherings that are on quite a significant international scale. One can think of the, the recent World Meeting of Families in mm. Dublin, World Youth Day would be another. The International Eucharistic Congress, or a, a, this, the National Eucharistic Congress, is certainly up there. Uh, Whose uh, who's idea was it that Liverpool should bid for an event of this uh, magnitude and significance? We were asked by the uh, Office for Eucharistic Congresses in Rome, led by Archbishop Marini, um, to have a Congress this year. And it, the bishops of England and Wales, in their plenary meeting, um, suggested Liverpool and I was thrilled that they did and gratefully accepted their confidence in our ability to host a conference of this size but also of this importance as well. What sort of uh, time and effort goes into organising something on this scale? Well we're very fortunate that we have considerable professional help uh, both within the Bishop's Conference and also the professional people we engage to help us do this. So that takes a lot of the pain out of it. Um, but, we, but it does require um, enormous preparation. It's taken us nearly two years to get to this point. Uh, and here we are, three days of uh, devotion and study towards our Lord mm -hmm. in the Eucharist. What are you most uh, looking forward to or what have you most enjoyed about this Eucharistic Congress? It's very hard to pick out one thing in particular, but for Catholics, the Eucharist is such an everyday part of their lives. Um, it's something, if we only go to Mass once a week or even less than that, it's the fruits of that uh, engagement with Christ in the Eucharist that, that feeds us from day to day. So. I'm very interested in the study day, that's the Friday, when we're going to look at different ways in which we can be Eucharistic in our lives. In other words, take the, 
the benefits of the of the sacrifice of Christ in the Eucharist into our everyday ordinary lives. And so that for me is the is is the highlight. Of course, the other events are going to be very uh, uplifting and encouraging. We've got some wonderful speakers. And our walk of witness with the Blessed Sacrament uh, at the end of the Congress, after the Congress Mass, uh, will be a tremendous thing. Tell us about that. There was a, a time in the history of England, and even more mm. recently in the history of Liverpool, which has known sectarianism and anti-Catholicism, where a, a Eucharistic procession through the streets of this city would have been unthinkable. So what does it mean to you as a city's archbishop to know that on Sunday our Lord will be taken through the streets of this city? Well, I'll be walking in that procession with the other Christian leaders, with Bishop Paul Bayes, the Anglican Bishop of Liverpool, with Dr. Cheryl Anderson, who's the moderator of the Methodist Church, and with leaders from the Baptists and from the uh, United Reformed churches, and also other church leaders. And we're going to walk together with the Blessed Sacrament through Liverpool. Now, as you've already mentioned, that, that's absolutely unheard of. Fifty years ago, that would have been impossible. But when Pope John Paul II came here, in 1982, the church leaders of the t day, Bishop David Shepherd, the Catholic Archbishop Derek Warlock, truly great man, and the Methodist moderator, Dr. John Newton, they walked with the Holy Father from the Anglican Cathedral at one end of Hope Street to the Metropolitan Cathedral, the Catholic Cathedral of Christ the King at the other end. And that was very much a turning point for us. So walking through the streets with the Blessed Sacrament is only possible because of the wonderful ecumenical work in healing the div some of the rifts and divisions between our Christian communities, which was really down to the, all those wonderful people, say John Paul II and others around that time. So I feel humbled and honoured to be part of that. And what do you hope when all this is concluded, come Sunday, what do you hope will be the fruit of this Eucharistic Congress, both for the Archdiocese of Liverpool and for the Church Universal? Well, I think for the individuals uh, who've been here, who've taken part in any of the events, or the masses, or the procession, um, I hope there will be a reawakening of the importance of the Eucharist in their daily lives. That has to be the fundamental thing. I think it also helps our parishes enormously to know that, that their, their, their worship of God in the Blessed Sacrament and in the Mass and in the in adoration, in the Eucharist, in that sense, is really an expression of the way in which we are united in the body of Christ and that how that unity can actually sustain us in our daily lives. So that will then make our parishes grow, give them a new focus, a new way of looking at the world. So they won't just see themselves in terms of structure and organization, but they'll see themselves truly as a, as a Eucharistic community. As it says in the Acts of the Apostles, they they will remain in the Apostles' teaching, in the fellowship or communion, we can use that word, the breaking of bread, the Mass in our, our terms, and their prayers. So you can see how those four aspects unite us together as, as Christians. And I really want that to penetrate people's hearts in their parishes in, and in the Archdiocese. In, Two years' time, in 2020, the Archdiocese of Liverpool is having a diocesan synod where we will be able to discern, with the, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the next steps forward for our Archdiocese. So having this Eucharistic Congress here uh, is really just such a blessing because it's going to, going to underpin and fuel all our devotion, our deliberations through devotions into the future. Without preempting yeah. that, yeah. Synod, what do you yeah. think parishes can do to become, as you say, more Eucharistic as a community? I know one thing you've been particularly keen on is that our parishes, our churches are 
open and remain open for those who wish to, mm. to visit the Blessed Sacrament at times when Holy mm. Mass is not being offered. When we visit the Blessed Sacrament, we engage with the sacrifice of Jesus in the Mass. That's what we're doing. And it's for us that means, you know, any Mass, of course, or every Mass, but particularly it would mean the Sunday Mass when we gather as a, as a parish community. And that has to be, the, for me, the, the, the focus for all our outward expression of faith. So one phrase I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of quoting, which came from an Irish Dominican friend of mine who's now with God, he's no longer with us, who said, when I was visiting him in South Africa, he preached at Mass and he said, you know, we cannot break the consecrated bread together in church without going out, outside and breaking unconsecrated bread. We have to share the unblessed bread with people. The two go together. So when we receive the Eucharist in church, it's an imperative for us, on us to then be charitable, to be sharing, to give of ourselves to others. They go together. You can't do one without the other. That's no. in our Christian understanding. And that's a very powerful thing for me. And so I'm hoping that this renewal of our devotion to the Blessed Sacrament will make us more aware of social justice issues, will make us you know, more caring of each other, will allow us to be, you know, to share what we have, but also to give of our time and ourselves to other people. In other words, be sacrificial ourselves. And what does the, mm -hmm. as a, as a mm -hmm. As a Christian, as a priest, as a, mm -hmm. as, a, as a bishop, what does the Eucharist mean to you in, in your daily life? Well, for me, it's the beginning and the end of my life. It's everything. It's, uh, I start the day in prayer before the Eucharist, and obviously I celebrate Mass, and I finish the day before the Eucharist. And for me, it, it gives me that, that connection across space and time, a very real connection, with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So for me, it's like standing at, or kneeling or being at the foot of the cross. And there I am, and, I, and it's that closeness to the Lord that I treasure most. And I hold that image of, of being close to Jesus on the cross uh, throughout my day. And that... Um, that sustains me in all that I do. One of the great privileges about being, being, a, about being a bishop, there aren't many, but one of, the, one of the, the, the plus points, the bonuses, is that you, are, you wear a cross all the time. And that stays close to my heart. It's called a pectoral cross for that reason. It stays on my chest, near my heart. And, uh, and that reminds me you know, of this... Uh, of, the, of this way in which I've been called to live my life, which is, of course, I hope, the way that all Christians will do as well. I'm sure there'll be many people watching mm. at home and Shalom World TV yeah. will be very touched by uh, your witness to your love of our Lord in the Eucharist. What, what do you think families can do to, and it's a great theme of, of, of these days as well, what can families do to pass on that love of the Eucharist to the next generation, to children uh, and, and very often to grandchildren? I think we, we have to start with very simple things. You have to, at the heart of family life, as we, as we learnt from the teaching of Pope Francis over the, the world meeting of families, that how important the family meal is in, uh, in our Christian homes, um, because all meals are holy. All meals involve sacrifice of the person who's prepared them. They're given with love and we receive with love what we're given. It's so important to, to remain in, in families around the table so that we can be close to the Lord in this way which is ordinary, which is down to earth, is necessary for our physical sustenance, but also unites us in love as a family. Now that strong family automatically will, will look out to the world and will help people. Now that is really at the heart of the, of the Eucharist, you know. 
it's not explicitly the Eucharist, but if you dedicate your, your meal with prayer and blessing, then we met in the Lord's name and he will be there in, in the midst of us. He's promised that. That's what underpins our sacramental understanding of Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. So there's so much. I think you start with that and then the rest should flow. And as our viewers attempt to go forth from this Eucharistic Congress and do exactly that, I was wondering if you could assist them, supernaturally speaking, along the way by imparting your, your, yeah. your, your, your blessing. Oh, very, very wonderful to be here in, in, at this Eucharistic Congress in Liverpool. There are many participants here. Over the three days, we will have nearly 20,000 people come together. And I'd like to unite with their prayers as we pray for you and your families that the Lord will be close to you in your everyday lives, that you will get to know him through worship and adoration, particularly in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and that you will be sustained and fed by the food of life, as the Fathers of the Church called the Eucharist. So with this divine food feeding us and loving us and giving itself for us so that we may share in the life of Christ which he so desperately wants us to do. We give, I give you my blessing then in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Archbishop McMahon, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. Thank you all very much. It's very good.